Hello and welcome to another edition of the Arena Craft Podcast dedicated exclusively to Magic Gathering Arena. My name is Arjun, I'm one of your hosts, the other host, the Roadrunner, the Speedrunner, the ultimate amazing magician. It's CGB. How are you doing today, CGB? I don't, I can't keep up with that. <laughs> what? What do you mean? I'm the Speedrunner. I'm Mr. <laughs> Let's Slow This Down. All right. <laughs> I'm the Patience is yeah, a Win Con guy. Yeah, t- Barry has entered the chat. <laughs> dude, dude, put put the drugs away. Oh my goodness. Uh, oh my you are wired, man. What's going on? I'm just pumped to talk about magic today. There's a lot going on. You and I have been very, very busy in the arena, both on the battlefield and off the battlefield. You know, I'm also auditioning, practicing for my career. As an auctioneer, right? Oh, an auctioneer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, 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 that's what I'm going for. And a one, a two, and a three, and a one, and a Okay, anyway. All right, so here's what we're talking about today. So we have Zendikar coming up, and that's an exciting set. We are not going to go deep on Zendikar today. What we're going to talk about today is everything that's rotating out of the format. So we figured that, you know, before the floodgates open up and the spoilers really start to hit beginning of September, we figured that now was a good time for us to just do a retrospective on the standard format, cover, you know, all of the important cards that with cards that we think are important that are going to rotate, probably talk about a couple of the cards that were cool but didn't quite get there. That's kind of like a palette cleanser. It's like a sunset show for the current standard. And then next week we can just go hard on Zendikar and not look back. But firstly, before we get into all of that, just a quick update because, I don't know, it's it's been a really fun week in the arena, I think, for both of us. And so I'm kind of curious what you've been up to, CGB. What have I been up to? I have been trying to live in a post-oops-broke-the-format world. <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 my DMs and my, my Twitter has mostly been filled with, geez, thanks a lot for sharing that Simic Adventures is the best deck with the world. Now, how the heck do we beat it? And it does yeah. seem like I can't, I can't play. I don't know about you. You tell me. I can't play 2021 standard without one third of it being Simic Adventure, one third of it being Teamer Adventure, and one third of it being something else I'm relieved to play against. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what's tilting for me is that it was just nothing but adventure for most of the week. And then I got tired of it and I decided to pretty fairly hard target adventure. And since I've done that, it's been almost no adventure. But it's fine. I'm I'm still winning matches, so it's it's chill. That's a, that sounds like a classic arena problem. I, I'm still facing it. Um, the last two videos that I made were, uh, the last three videos I made were decks trying to figure out how to beat Simic Adventure and te- and of course also have a good matchup with Teamer at the same time. And the decks I played are white, green, <laughs> and Demir Mutate Flash. So those are like the three decks I've been playing. And I've been winning a lot against Simic Adventure. It's kind of one of those things where we built it. Now we must destroy it. But I will say, I'll put it like this. Fetching with Fae of Wishes, man. Dude. What you fetch with Fae of Wishes is such an art form. And you can tell when people either haven't done it enough or are scared to do it right. The game I just played, I should have lost. It should have been a landslide. But my opponent is sitting on a Fae of Wishes with two cards in hand, and I know they're not that relevant because they didn't play anything with their turn. And I'm even, like, you'll be able to watch this on my YouTube later. I'm saying to the camera, what they're going to do is discard their two cards to feed an Uro later. They're going to fetch Ugin because that's what they always do when they're scared. They always get Ugin, man. You can always tell the amateur adventure player because they snatch the Ugin. Oh, yeah. And, like, I'm playing mono green, but I have a Great Henge, which the Ugin will not solve. And I have a 1-1 Stone Coil Serpent, which the Ugin will not solve. And in my hand, I'm holding back, like, a Gem Razor and a backup Questing Beast. And my board is, like, a Yorvo and a Questing Beast and this 1-1 Serpent and a, and a Henge. And it's like, Ugin is going to solve about half that equation, then it's going to die, and then you used your Ugin. And they've they keep trading their love struck beasts. And it's like Ugin has probably been fetched against me about 30 times this week. Not once 
has a single opponent fetched sleep, not once, and just put me away. Like that sleep and once in future, man, that's that's how you do it. If you have two Lovestruck Beasts, or if you even have one Uro, which draws cards and gains life with every attack, if you can go sleep into once in future sleep, you get so far ahead. There's like nothing people can do about it. The decks I just named, my Demir Flash deck is Umori. Umori as a companion. It's all creatures. You're running Umori? Wow. <laughs> Throwback. Yeah. Throwback yeah. Tuesday. That's amazing. So I, what do you think, man? I know that this is the kind of thing that gasses you up. What yeah, do you think? yeah. So it's always a question, right? Like, how do you beat adventure? I remember when Teamer Adventure was really climbing on the standard ladder. It was probably after uh, after Aaron Gertler won DreamHack with it was when it really was kind of exploding onto the ladder. And everyone had this question of how do I beat adventure? How do I beat adventure? How do I beat adventure? And the answer in my mind is is a little bit similar to how you beat wilderness reclamation is that you have to account for it and sometimes you still don't. Whenever you have a best deck in the format which is able to attack on multiple angles, it's hard to just like really, really lock up the matchup. And so what I try to do is I try to play decks that are functional so decks that can play a fine game of Magic no matter what, and decks that run cards main deck that are just good against the boogeyman, then hope to get there through that combination of things. And so it's actually one of the reasons I got so into mono green when Wilderness Wreck was a big thing, was because it was a deck that I felt had a solid matchup against Wreck and also didn't really sacrifice anything to do so. So what I, you know, what, what I was thinking about, there were two things that I came up with this week to attack Simic Adventure. Um, the first one was a deck which I felt was a pretty hard target, but was also a fine deck to play, which was just a gruel list. And um, it, it's, it's very similar, actually, to, you know, a list that's, that we've seen on the ladder in previous standards and which we've talked about a little bit on the show. And it is actually an adventure list. It's just running Innkeeper. It's main decking uh, Emberth Shield Breakers. I'm also main decking a couple of copies of uh, Gem Razor. And then it's just got your usual kind of gruel aggro plan of questing beasts, finish them off with uh, Embercleave, stuff like that. And I'm also running in the two drop slot I would run this anyway, but it's also good against Simic Adventure. I'm also running the Scavenging Ooze. So that's a deck which can just present a pretty cogent aggro plan, try and kill them on turn four or five with Ember Cleave, and then just main decks a bunch of cards which are actually pretty good against Adventure. So that was one approach I ran. The other approach I was thinking about, which I haven't tried as much, but I actually think could be quite solid, is just Teamer Adventure main decking Ember with Shieldbreaker. And so I think, you know, I like I replaced the two flex slots with the shield breaker. And then I think I shaved down one uh, love struck beast to run another one. And I don't remember whether I was doing three or four copies, but just that one tweak, my deck doesn't lose much. And the worst case scenario is that I can hopefully just cycle those shield breakers with my innkeeper and it's kind of okay. But, you know, if I come up against another adventure list, my main deck has just four copies that are slightly better in the mirror than what they're running and hope that that's going to get me ahead. So those were kind of the two things that I've thought about. I've been running the Gruel list and absolutely smashing people, so that's great. I haven't tried the the Teema list, but I, I think it's a pretty solid game plan. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The main thing about Simic Adventure that... I think people have trouble with is you can beat it in the late game. It's just most people don't have the patience or really <laughs> have the focus to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, you need a way to keep up with their cards because they're going to draw a million cards between Uro and Innkeeper. So you do need like a carded engine, whether it's a mutate engine with Slither Wisp or whether it's a great henge, whatever it is, you have to keep up. If you're white, you have to like close the game on turn five. There's no, there's no other way around that. But uh, those other decks, once you have a card advantage engine, you just ignore like their innkeepers and you work around their euros and you try to find ways to push damage and get lethal. Um, and you can win long games. Like I've, I've done it a lot. It's just so. Oh my gosh, it takes so long. It's we're, tedious. we're, we're. 
Yeah. Did you enjoy waiting the extra 15 minutes to start this co- podcast because I was trying to close out a Civic Adventure player? Try in 45 true irony. minutes, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Um, yeah, that's that's a Blue Mage's skewed uh, view on time there. But anyway, it's here's the thing about Simic Adventure, right? Is that in some ways it's actually kind of a dorky list. Like it plays a lot of cards that can actually be pretty bad if you if you attack them right. So my discovery is that if you can shut them down to any amount in the early game, and then just like you said, if you have any kind of card engine that can get you through the mid and late game, you can probably overcome them, you know, provided your deck is playing powerful cards. And so that like that's that's one of the reasons why I like the these uh gruel innkeeper lists is that your A plan could just be coming out too hard for them to catch you. And then your B plan, you can at least just start drawing a bunch of cards with your innkeepers and draw additional ember cleaves, draw additional questing beasts, just stuff like that. It's my favorite approach to playing aggro is if you can find an aggro list that actually does have a source of card advantage in it, it's kind of the best of both worlds because sometimes you just get them. And then if you don't, you have a backup plan. And I, you know, I had games playing my gruel list, yeah, where I was playing against a mono green deck, for example, and like they'd get out of hand and I would just smash it with my shield breaker. And then I would just draw, you know, I had one game where I, I just went wide on them. You know, I just played twice as many creatures as they did and just swung for lethal eventually. So that's, that's the style. I have to say though, it, it's kind of telling that in order to beat adventures, I turned to an adventures list. So, you know, adventures still, still strong, basically. I, I think what you're saying is that I'm the real hero figuring out how to beat them with, other cards. I think that's what you're trying to say. Well, I'm glad that your your Demir flash list seems to have taken off because I have been trouncing that list on the ladder. So thank you for that, CGB. Appreciate no, that video is not out yet. Just oh, wait till not? you see my version. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. So mm-hmm. I, I've played against some some version of the deck, which I'm sure it's fine, but you know it hasn't been able to keep up with what I've been doing. But your your list is probably the one to go with. All right. Well, that's our week in the arena for slaying the beast that we created. It's been very satisfying to kind of go through that plot arc. Very quickly before we go to our main topic, just wanted to acknowledge that we've had a couple of uh, Planeswalkers spoiled for Zendikar. We're not going to go deep in on them this week, but we have a Nahiri and we have a Jace. I feel like they're more in keeping with the Planeswalker designs that we've seen in the last few sets. And it's just kind of relieving to me. Are you feeling the same way, CGB? It's interesting because they don't have ultimates. Yeah. So that's a lot like the Planeswalkers that had passives, but they don't really have passives either. So yeah, yeah, I'm I'm down with these. And it's hard to score them without seeing more cards. So that's yeah. why we're going to put it off for a little while. Yeah, that's it. You know, they're, they're, both of them are Planeswalkers that could actually be quite strong. But it's, I mean, it is just usually the case with Planeswalkers, right? It's all about the shell. It's all about the meta. It's all about what else gets printed. Another thing that we wanted to discuss real quick is just that we've had a banning in Historic. And I think because it was one card and because everyone expected it, we didn't feel pressured to like release some kind of breaking news podcast about it. But Field of the Dead, no longer in Historic, to the surprise of nobody, I would say. I just want to note that I think you and I have both been pretty vocal proponents of having that card banned ever since it was unrestricted in the format. Here's what I'm curious about, CGB. I've seen a number of notable historic magic personalities talking about how they didn't think this card needed to be banned. Uh, Jeff Hoagland is one example. I know that Crokies has frequently said that he doesn't think the card is necessarily a tier one card without other busted cards like Wilderness Wreck built up around it. So I'm just curious if you have any quick thoughts on, on that whole thing. The card is boring. The card is stupid. The card is redundant. The card gets more broken every time a new land is printed or a card that can fetch a land or a card of any color whatsoever because it can be in any color deck. Why does it? There's no point. I don't think I have to say much more. The fact that we didn't even do like a banned show, like I didn't even go live when this got banned. It was such an eye roll. I think the main story here is the tilt that comes from why was it unsuspended in the first place? 
They already knew that they were going to have an Amonkhet Remastered, which has Hour of Promise in it, which breaks this card in half. Already got it banned out of Pioneer with this interaction. They didn't have to put Hour of Promise in Amonkhet Remastered. They, there were other hours. I think Hour of Eternity is one that they did not print in, our, in Amonkhet Remastered. They did it anyway. Just keep, just ban it and be done. And that's what they did this time. They didn't send it back to the suspended list, but they could have just kept it banned. It feels like a scam. That's, that's the part that I think is worth discussing. The arena economy is expensive. Historic arena is really expensive. And Amonkhet Remastered and Jumpstart have added a ton of cards that require a ton of wild cards to craft. And Field of the Dead in particular says you have to play with all these different lands. And I bet most of them are rare. And it sucks. It really sucks to ban the only card that held that deck together again after people have dived into this expensive format and crafted all these cards. And it feels scammy because they didn't have to unsuspend it in the first place. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? Because I got a little conspiratorial when I looked at this set, the uh, Amonkhet Remaster, because it, it did kind of look like a like a money grab to me. Basically, no one would have crafted Hour of Promise if Field of the Dead hadn't been in the format. The fact that they chucked in Thoughtseize and Wrath of God and a number of these other kind of extracurricular quote-unquote cards, I think were all to just try to motivate people to actually crack those packs, to play it in Limited, etc., etc., uh, to spend those wild cards. Because otherwise, okay, it's a fun set. I like the set. I think it's fine. But how many of those cards would people have really crafted? Yeah, but but to be clear, I am okay with them putting cool, fun cards. Like, if you're going to take my money, take it that way. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm I'm totally with you. But I think that you're right that it does feel a little odd to have like a ban on the horizon, which just seems so... It's like a ban in a can. We release this set, and then in two to three weeks... We ban the card. Basically, anyone could have seen that coming. So it does just make people such as you and myself feel a little bit cynical about the business model. But like we've said before, I think the the ban is excellent. And the only question is why, yeah, why they ever unsuspended it in the first place. I'm going to jump on a bandwagon. This wasn't my idea. I heard it through the game podcast. You heard it somewhere else. But they should give you like double wild cards when they ban stuff. Like it should hurt them. They messed up and we invested in something that they took away. It should be double wild cards at least. I mean, in a way it kind of makes sense because they ban it in standard and then they ban it in historic. So if it's banned in two different formats, I, to me it makes sense that you would get wild cards per format. Different decks, different cards you had to craft yeah. to stay competitive. Yeah. Frankly, it, it keeps players happy when you do stuff like that and it costs them basically nothing. So yeah, I, it's, a, it's a good idea. It's also just something nice that you can do in digital that you can't do in paper. I just think that that's that's something to think about as well. All right. Well, all of that out of the way, I think it is now time for us to take a deep dive, as we like to do, into rotation. Thank the Lord for this rotation. Hallelujah. Even if Standard ends up being a weird place for the next one or two sets, I think that we're all going to be just happy for the change. Every time this September comes around, we're happy for rotation. But this particular one, this might be like one of the most anticipated rotations in Magic's history. So The only one I remember being close to this was Kaladesh. Yep. And I'm not sure. It's between those two. And they're both like formats where so many things were banned but the same stuff was always good and people are so sick of it yeah absolutely really really excited for the rotation one thing i want to note about the format today i left off of our list and hopefully you're all right with this all of the banned cards in standard because (laughs) basically they've already rotated we've already you know thousands of articles have been written thousands more could we say yeah exactly so we've already we've basically already discussed them rotating so we're just going to leave those off the list but you know what they are they're the bad guys but what i want to talk about today is basically 
just let's let's talk about like all of the staples that are leaving the format. And I also want to, you know, pour pour a few drinks out for some of those cards that were really sweet that we thought were really going to get there when they were spoiled that didn't quite. So that's that's basically what we're going to talk about. Now, my idea around this was to go loosely by color. So I have this list of cards by color and they will naturally branch us off in different directions. Uh, I, I think that's the best way to structure it. Does that sound good to you, CGB? I'm in. Excellent. So we're just going to do it the old-fashioned Wooberg way. So uh, we're going to start with white. And the first thing that jumped out to me when I was looking through the list is that we are basically losing our white weenie deck. Like all of the building blocks of our kind of go wide white strategy are basically leaving the format. So let's look at what's going out in the in the cheap slot. We're losing Healer's Hawk, Hunted Witness, Raise the Alarm. These have all just been absolute staples in any kind of go-wide strategy. And then we're also losing our top end in that strategy in Venerated Loxodon. So in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, CGB, but basically the only cards I'm seeing left in this kind of white aggro, closer to the ground white strategy is like the life gain thing. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, Although... It's not on the list, but a Johnny's Pride Mate is rotating, yes, which correct. is a blow, although we have the priest, so maybe it's fine. But yeah, the life gain shell, is it feels like it is the only thing left if you're thinking of casting white creatures and being aggressive. It makes me wonder if Zendikar is going to bring us, like, is it warriors, the big Zendikar thing? Or soldiers, maybe? Weren't cores on... Core? Weren't, weren't there cores? There were allies, right? Maybe allies. The last something time like we that. went there, allies. It yeah. makes me wonder if they're going to add some, right? Because they did give us, they gave us cards like Basri Cat, all the Basri stuff, basically Basri's Solidarity, the 1 1 pump enchantment. So it makes me wonder if they're going to give us an influx in, in the Zendikar set. I hope so. Knights are still a tribe. I'd prefer something different, but um, knights and humans seem like the closest thing to active tribes yeah yeah so just something to look out for and one of the themes i think we're gonna harp back on a lot when we're going down this list is just that we're losing a lot of the most important one and two drops in every aggro archetype Oof. so it's really a blow man aggro is just gonna need a, a stiff shot in the arm if we're gonna get there in this next set i agree yeah, so uh, next thing that I saw on the list was that we're losing Devout Decree, and that got me thinking about just like the color hoser cycle. Those cards have been really actually quite powerful when you look down the list. So we have Devout Decree, Noxious Grasp, Ether Gust. Those were the three that kind of jumped out to me the most as cards that have, especially Ether Gust being kind of a main deck card for arguably the last feels like a year basically so yeah i'm just curious what you think about that it's incredible that these color hoser cards from m20 were kind of created and we saw them as sideboard cards as we always do but they actually became crucial to keeping the format in check and you could say that that was still a failure because you could main deck these cards and it still didn't deter people from playing the best decks. It just made it a little harder for them to absolutely snowball you as quickly as possible. The amount of main deck Aether Gust and Noxious Grasp we saw during the duration of the format was kind of insane. If if you don't remember the Noxious Grasp format, it was when everything was Simic and then going into the MC where Oko was still legal, but Field of the Dead wasn't. The adaptation was to play Sultai so you could run four main deck Noxious Grasp. <laughs> That's how much Simic there was. It's kind of strange that you saw Color Hoser so strong that they saw main deck meta play and still couldn't like dissuade people from playing those decks because they were that good. Yeah, frequently what we saw was basically people just bringing them in for the mirror. That's That was kind of a thing that we saw going on a lot, where it's like, I want to play the best deck, and I want to play the color hoser, which hoses the best deck. So it's interesting because it does indicate an unhealthy format, but at the same time, it's kind of vital. It's like, where would we have been if we hadn't had Noxus Grasp? Where would we have been if we hadn't had Ether Gust? So as much as I'm tired of Ether Gust especially... 
I mean, I, I really am pretty stoked I'm never going to have to deal with another ether gust. But at the same time, if we hadn't had it, Nyssa would have always hit. Casualties of War would, I mean, not always, you know, but it's just like all of these busted cards, Embercleave, etc., would have had such a hard time. Yeah, 2021 standard is best of one, and I think that's definitely for the best, because have you tried to build a sideboard uh, post-rotation? Oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> the only card that sticks, like, really is Mystical Dispute. That one, yeah. for some reason, was in Eldraine and is still around, but Oh my gosh, are the sideboards just weird heinous. right now. Just yeah. heinous. Yeah. Oh yeah, especially for like a control strategy. It's like, get out of here. I, I'm looking at Ashiox Erasure going, I mm, guess. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, and somebody out there is going to try to tell me that's a good card. <laughs> that, yeah. That, it's not a good sign when, when that's what you're looking to for answers. Nope. No, indeed. All right, let's keep going down the list here. Uh, another thing that jumped out at me, I wanted to talk about the Cavalier cycle because I think that this cycle ended up being pretty relevant overall. I would say the least relevant ones were actually the White One, Cavalier of Dawn, and then also Cavalier of Night are the two that I put down as the cards that never really seem to get there. All of the rest of them, the, the Cavaliers in the Tima colors... I think all saw play with probably Cavalier of Gales being the least prominent. And I don't know about you, CGB, but I almost feel like it was the green Cavalier that ended up being maybe the most played of all of them. But it's it's probably a tie between the green and the red. I think the Red Cavalier would have been cast more because of how popular Fires of Invention strategies got at their peak. Yeah. A, a green Cavalier deck never reach those heights you know what i mean yeah uh, of and it competed with nissa in the five slot the whole time which was probably the only reason quite honestly i think green cavalier without nissa would have been a lot more popular but yeah I, I i'm with you i see what you're saying well here's the thing so in the beginning when green cavalier was printed it was actually seeing a lot of play in the field of the dead strategies because field of the dead elementals was kind of a thing and then since then, we've it just keeps popping up on the ladder. It keeps popping up on the ladder. And I, I would agree with you that it was never quite tier one in the way that the, the Red Cavalier was. But I would just say for, for seeing so much play in just general ladder play across its entire life in the format, uh, I'm, I'm going to give the gold star to the Green Cavalier. But I agree that... You know, Red Cav was probably the one with the highest ceiling. Yeah. I mean, Red Cav needed fires. Yeah, that's like, it. It's seen, it seen basically no place since then. Green Cavalier could stand on its own. So right. uh, you know it doesn't break my heart to see a green card win over a red card. I'll be fine with this. <laughs> <laughs> so we're putting them to sleep. I have to say that I think it says something about magic that the white and the black Cavaliers didn't see really any play competitively because they're both cards which would have made a much bigger splash in kind of old school magic, but we have moved away from old school magic and there you go. Just wanted to pour one out for all of the God Eternals because oh. basically none of them ever got there. Bontu saw some fringe play in some of these like fires, sacrifice decks. And I also remember Kevin, the blue one, saw some fringe play in these kind of blue uh, Demir controlly decks. But really, they were all just kind of let us down. Poor Kefnet. That was one of my favorite cards when it came <laughs> out. Um, and all of these, there were other problems, but I think the key offenders that just put a nail in their coffin were Oko and Teferi Time Raveler. Just to fairy time raveler sticking around as long as it did was probably the biggest problem. Just made them a complete joke. They came in, they didn't usually get much value on the way in. You needed to untap with them. So it is sad. We we should have had better from the reanimated gods of Amonkhet. I agree. The one that stood out to me that I felt was sure to get some kind of airtime was Oketra, just because oh, yeah. the effect was so powerful. And we did see like a handful of these Jeskai Fires lists ended up running the Singleton Oketra, but it really never became a standardized part of the format. And 
Yeah, I think that's just that's one of those things where when a double striking indestructible creature that just poops out four fours like it's no tomorrow doesn't see play in your format, I think that's really an indication of of just how absurd things have become. I mean, it eventually would have gotten owned pretty hard by cards like Elspeth Conquers Death. But even before that card was printed, Oketcha was just not not happening. So anyway, that, that was the one that I was kind of sad about. Now let's talk about, we are losing some of our interesting Wraths in the form of Time Wipe and Kaya's Wrath. I think that the printing of Shatter the Sky has basically made that fine. And I think that Shatter the Sky ended up being the preferred Wrath of choice. Do you have any thoughts though on us losing either of these ones? I actually think that Extinction Event uh, mm, is, yep. and and there's Storm's Wrath too, but different colors. But I think that Extinction Event is really something that bridges the gap here. That that card has turned out to be uh, to matter Such a lot. A I think, yeah, yeah. So I don't think we're going to miss Time Wiper Kai's Wrath. Both were. Uh, I think that Kai's Wrath did something cool where it showed that you can have. A no restriction wrath with upside as long as it's hard to cast and it barely made a dent in the format. And then time wipe was a wrath with an upside, but it was five mana. I think that we've learned that our wraths, when they're our wraths really need to be four mana. Four mana matters a lot. And even if they have a downside, if they're easier to cast and you know you get it on turn four, that's that's what wins. So uh just interesting kind of that we had them all together and we got to figure out what we really needed from a sweeper. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And just an indication of format speeding up. Like, you just couldn't have a five-mana Wrath against cards like Embercleave, cards like Questing Beast, etc., etc. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the White Walkers. We're really just not missing much. And this is kind of my takeaway. It really reinforced to me the idea that a lot of people have been talking about, which is just that White has been fairly weak. I was trying to come up with important cards that are rotating in white, and it was just kind of tough. It was kind of tough for me to supply what I felt like was a really solid list of white cards, and it it basically made me realize that white for the past year or so has really felt like a support, more of a support color in standard than anything else, with some exceptions. A lot of the strongest white cards that are rotating were cards like Teferi that was already banned. We're losing our Gideon, right? I don't think anyone's really going to cry a tear for the three mana Gideon. You're supposed to. He's dead now. Like in the story, Gideon's oh yeah, dead yeah, now. yeah. This exactly. is this is the actual last Gideon in standard, right? <laughs> that's true. That's true. So so rip Gideon. The other one was a Johnny Strength of the Pride, which saw some play in these white life gain decks. But again, eh, it's pretty narrow. Strength of the Pride was kind of a trap too. Oh yeah, people would always play it and go for the thirty five life. Yeah. It, it was like the it was the white whale, and uh, usually if you can punish him for it, like you can take advantage of that. I actually think the life gain decks might be better without it, and instead you add like Elspeth, which has multiple modes. Maybe it should have been Elspeth the whole time. Yeah, yeah, good thought. All right, any other thoughts on white before we put it to rest? Dude, it's been so bad for white. It's been man. so bad. It's been so bad. Yikes! Uh, my my favorite. My my good old fashioned blue white control. It's like white doesn't give you good removal. It gives you a five mana enchantment that you don't really want to be playing things at that speed anyway. In Elspeth Conquers Death, like what's the two mana white card that they could play that you'd actually be afraid of? There there just isn't one anymore. No, it's white needs white needs. They it's been said a million ways. It needs an identity. I hope we see one. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like white needs to continue to print cards like Thalia, cards that are these high impact cheap creatures that can really have a game warping effect to even have a chance, I think, because yeah, other than that, it's basically just like the wrath color in your control deck or occasionally we put together enough history of Banalias and stuff like that, that we get some kind of of white weenie aggro deck, but I mostly agree. It's just, it it really needs something. It really needs some sauce. What would you think if Hushbringer were a (laughs) 3-2 instead (laughs) of a 1-2? For two two mana. (laughs) Well, yeah, think about that, right? It has a game warping effect and it can close the game before you just lose. And it forces the opponent to remove it and interact. Isn't that what magic should do? That's actually a really, it's a good thought, right? Even if Hushbringer had just been a 2-2, would have would have i think made yep. a big difference yeah 
that that's getting there. That's why I think they should just take that kind of aspect of white and make it more aggressive. Yes. Because everything else is more aggressive. Everything else. You're right. It's the, I think the combination of ag- aggressive and disruptive is something that white could in theory do very well. And it has in theory, it has done so. I mean, we see in all the formats, these human decks being quite disruptive and quite strong. So... Yeah, what if Dranith Magistrate was a 3-1 instead of a 1-3? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. why not? Why exactly. Not? Yeah, so we'd love to see a direction like that. All right, let's jump into blue. Now, talk about a color that's losing some important pieces here. I can't watch. Do it without me. Cover your eyes, CGB. <laughs> Cover your eyes. First of all, we just have to play the long, sad taps for all of the counter spells that are leaving the format. Because, I mean, holy snap, we have a lot of counter spells leaving. Let's talk about what's going out. We have Quench. We have Negate. Disdainful Stroke. Absorb. Sinister Sabotage. Dovin's Veto. Control Favorite, Dovin's Veto. Is there anything else I'm missing here? Just the sad taps like you said. <laughs> it's been a long da, da, da. day. Without you, my friend, I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. Dude, it's me and Neutralize against the world, man. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yikes. There's, like, no good counters. Yikes. They just just ripped them away. Oh, it's going to be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Control and Aggro are both going to need a lot. So, yeah, Control's really losing a lot here. We're also losing some of our most important planeswalkers in control in the in form of Narset Potter of Veils is kind of, I think, Planeswalker A, which more controlling decks are really going to be missing in standard. Just wanted to highlight a couple of other interesting planeswalkers in blue. We're losing Ashiok 3, which while admittedly was never an A player in the format, I think was a semi-frequent sideboard inclusion, could do a fair amount of damage. We're also losing Tamio, the uh, War of the Spark Tamio, which is a card which, again, has never been like fully S tier, but was just often a player in, in pretty strong decks. The three that you just mentioned were, you could also summarize as we're losing the most obnoxious passive planeswalker abilities. The, the biggest groans when you forget. You know oh, what I mean? Oh my gosh. If I never have to cast another growth spiral into Narset, if I never have to try to cycle another card into Narset, if I never have to try to crace this into a Narset again for the rest of my life, I will be a happy camper. Yeah, that's the big one, but you also will never risk sacking your fabled passage into the Ashiok or casting the Doom Foretold into the Tamio. Like, like these are all things that I think genuinely made magic less fun, not more interesting. Absolutely. So they can walk into the into the wild beyond. You have served your purpose, walkers. Walk on. Another kind of archetype that is basically getting gutted here is the Flash. The Simic Flash archetype is losing a lot of its best cards. So Spectral Sailor, Brineborn Cutthroat, Nightpack Ambusher is going. I'm not going to be sad to see the Wolfie go. And Frilled Mystic as well. So some of these cards weren't always a staple in the deck, but just a lot of solid, solid Simic Flash cards are leaving, and I expect that. I expect that archetype to die a quick, horrible death with the rotation. I believe Wildborn Preserver right now is the only, like, serious Flash holdout in green. So it looks like, it looks like Flash is being left to the Demir Mages. Yep, absolutely. With questionable results. I, but I, oh, come on now. We'll, We'll see. But, I mean, did you like that green had Flash? Did you think that green needed that as well? Green has card draw, green has flash, now green has good removal. Like, what What does green do badly? I, I, I'm at a loss. I agree. I, I actually always felt like Nightpack Ambush it was just a, a violent betrayal of the color pie. The fact that it was just one of the best things to be doing in that archetype as well, it, it kind of warped the archetype, to be honest. It, it warped an archetype that really shouldn't have ever been green. So I totally agree. 
Yeah, I think I think Wildborn Preserver is good. I think that card is fine because it gives you kind of aggro options against sweepers. It has reach. It's it's a it's a useful enough two drop. So that one gets the pass from me. But yeah, a card like Ambusher, I just think it should have been blue. Just other notable card we're losing here: Mass Manipulation card, which has definitely made a splash at different points in Standard. One of the big top end blue spells, finisher blue spells, is leaving the format. Is there anything else that's going out of blue that you can think of, CGB, that is... Uh, I was just going to say on the mass manipulation thing, it, at least you don't have to lecture people about their Fae of Wishes targets with that one anymore. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boy. Like, <laughs> Agreed. Um, what's going out of blue? The soul, man. The soul, the soul is, of blue. The soul is gone, <laughs> man. Um, nah, blue... I, you, know, you know I love blue, but it's just... When you don't have counterplay and you're reliant on bounce to interact, you need like blue now becomes a support color. It's it 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 has been this at various times throughout standard, and it's going to without drastic changes be this again, where it cannot stand alone because all it can do is bounce a permanent. It can't really draw cards very well. Um, although Gadwick is still around, that's probably going to be one of the best card drawing effects that you can get. Is but it takes a lot of mana. So you can't remove anything, but now you can't counter anything. It seems like blue is going to be leaning heavily on black, and I can't really think of anything else that fills that gap for blue. Like, what else can you play blue with? It, it's weird, because you want to say Simic, because there is Uro. But every time I built a, a deck with Uro, and we, we talked about adventures already, so leaving adventures aside. But every time I built a deck with Uro, it was like the only blue card in my deck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we saw that a lot with Oro Growth Spiral, where you'd have these decks that were predominantly green and maybe another color that were almost just splashing Oro and Growth Spiral. And I guess it gave you access to counter magic in the sideboard as well, which was cool in best of three games, but... I mean, in a way, it feels like a bit of a relief because maybe we won't be as plagued by Oro in the coming formats as, okay, so this is really interesting. People, especially in my stream, have been jumping in saying that Oro gets only stronger post-rotation. I don't know about that. I'm kind of skeptical, actually, as to Oro's role in standard moving forward. Now, of course, we're going to need to see what Zendikar is like. It's a land set, so Oro could just continue to be a powerhouse. But do you think that it's kind of obvious or necessarily a given that Oro gets better with a narrower format and considering everything we're losing? What do you think? What bothers me about it is I think that Oro's Ur role and use gets narrower, but it's still broken. So if the only good Oro deck is Simic Adventures, it's just going to be most of the format because Oro is broken. Like, if, if Sultai is a much worse Uro deck, people just aren't going to play it, right? So that's what, that's what makes me nervous. And I still feel that Simic Adventures right now is the only thing that fills the role because of Merfolk Secret Keeper, because it fills its graveyard. The other decks aren't very good at this. So, yeah, I, uh, I am nervous. I am nervous about Uro in the future because I just don't want every game to feel the same. I agree with you there. I just think that Oro is one of these cards that it can't flow to deck on its own. And I think that it differs from cards like Nissa in that regard. Because, I mean, you can just throw Nissa in a deck. She's going to be good. She's going to win games. She's going to make the rest of your deck better. No questions asked, basically. But I don't think you can say the same for a card like Oro. So I think that if the supporting cast is not there... Or if Oro is not itself the supporting cast for an existing busted strategy, then I think it does get a lot worse. So I think my, my real question is, what are our green incentives moving forward to be playing Oro? Because I don't think blue, I don't, it's hard for me to imagine something jumping into the blue color, which is going to really incentivize us to play Oro. Maybe there's going to be more kind of Sultai graveyard shenaniganing in entering the format, but to, to, I'm going to be looking at green. I'm going to be looking at green to see whether that's giving us more incentives to play Oro. All right, let's move on to black. Now, I was looking at black, and boy, man, black is losing some of its power cards. I think black, it, for me, it's a tie between black 
Actually, no, black, red, and green all just lose a tremendous amount. So let's jump into it right away. Basically, what you have known as the aggressive mono black deck in standard is just getting gutted. We're losing Gutter Bones, Knight of the Ebon Legion. So those are basically the only playable black one drops at the moment. Rotting Regisaur is going. One of the main incentives to play one of these decks. We're even losing Spawn of Mayhem. And then if you start looking in the Rakdos direction, we're also losing Dreadhorde Butcher, Judith. So basically, like all of our good aggressive cheap options in black are just gone. It's a tragedy. Have you have you built some black 2021 decks? I I haven't even tried. I mean, the stats are put are just embarrassing. Here's my one mana one one whisper squad. Here's my one mana one two beat you down, man. Here's my three mana three two. Yeah. I, there's there's no aggression to be found. I mean, there are games against like Simic where you never attack. You don't have a good attack from the start of the game to the end. So the black decks just lean in on these synergies with like Bastion of Remembrance and um, Grey Merchant. And like, it's so easy to disrupt. If the opponent does anything and messes with your board presence, your cards do nothing. It's It's a bad place, man. It's a bad look for mono black. It's rough. It's super rough because then if you pivot into another one of these main black strategies, which has been kind of these black-based sacrifice decks, they're also just getting absolutely gutted. We're losing one of our best cards in Priest of the Forgotten Gods, basically one of our best sack enablers. And then we're also losing Mayhem Devil, which is one of our best sack rewards, right? So I just, I feel like sack got really heavily hit, especially with the loss of the cat as well. So it's kind of, it's pretty brutal. I had hoped that Arcfiend's Vessel would be your way to bridge the gap, like Arcfiend's Vessel Luris, just one mana five fives. But there's still one mana five fives that are tokens. And without Teferi, I had hoped this would be fixed. But the fact that Brazen Borrower is like the best card in the format most of the time is kind of, it, it's just sad. It's just, it's like one one mana five five flyer, not good enough. It's not, especially since sometimes you look at these decks and you're like, that's it. That's the finish. Yeah, that's, that's the combo, baby. <laughs> Got them. That's your big top end, right? It's like, Got them. It's one thing if the five five is a distraction on the way to the actual finish in your deck, but it's really not. It's, that's kind of it. So... Yeah, these decks are just losing a lot. So even though they do have, they do have interesting cards still, like Village Rights is a very strong card. We still have Claim the Firstborn, amazing card. Woe Strider, fantastic. Luris, sure, Archfiend's Vessel is fine, but we just need something else. We need another Mayhem Devil. We need some kind of top end threat. Maybe we need, I don't I don't know what we need, but there's something missing from this archetype. Croxa needs help. Yeah. Proxa needs Proxa. a lot of help. He's still a super powerful card that can get the job done, yeah. but he can't do it alone. No, indeed. Yeah, we need more uh, Stitches Suppliers. That's really the card. Like These uh, these Croxa decks have been really missing Stitches Supplier. So, yeah, rip, rip. All right, we're also losing some of our important black sweepers in the form of Ritual of Soot and Cry of the Carnarium. So any any kind of black controlling deck or even just black deck that wants a good sideboard against certain strategies is going to be stressed a little thin. Now, you are correct that we did we did pick up extinction events, so that's a very very important pickup. But I and we keep the best spot like um we also keep the best spot removal in the format. That's true. So I think black is good on this front. But go on, sorry. Well, here's the other thing I was going to say is that I actually think cry is a pretty that's a pretty bad loss because. The alternative that we got, we got some other dorky three mana stuff gets minus two, minus two, and what, Planeswalkers take two damage or something card, which no one probably even remembers that that card was printed. Pestilent Haze. (laughs) Pestilent Haze. But Cry has actually been a fairly crucial card against a number of different strategies and standards, so that, that one hurts, I think, a little bit. I think the decks that cry was good against got destroyed much worse than just the loss of cry. You know what I mean? That's a good point. (laughs) All right. Let's talk about, we're also losing one of our top ends in the form of Bolas's Citadel. 
So that's a card. Talk about a card which got there, man. This was a card which when it was spoiled, everyone thought, all right, that's pretty powerful. It did actually see some play as a one or two of in some old school control decks in previous standards. But boy, has Bolas' Citadel exploded onto the scene in the last basically set or so. I mean, this card not only has been very, very strong in standard, but it's been taking a lot of other formats by storm. I mean, one of the best things to be doing in historic and even modern at this point is kind of blowing up with Citadel. So this card has been really doing it. Yeah, uh, Citadel has a good future in historic and in pioneer and modern as long as it doesn't get banned and uh, i don't think it will it's a it's a sweet card and i will miss it i loved it most when i got to play it in like the esper hero decks before eldraine came out that that was where citadel and i were best friends yep fantastic card just wanted to pour one out for a couple of black based and black adjacent mechanics that never quite got there first of all the surveil package occasional surveil cards were important. So obviously, and, and another one that we should talk about is Thought Erasure, right? Because that's like one of the big, one of the big important black-based cards, which was a surveil card is Thought Erasure. So we're losing that rip. But th- like anything resembling a surveil deck never came together. I'm trying to get a lot of games in with disinformation campaign before it's gone. Like tomorrow's video, I believe, is a disinformation campaign Esper list. And I've got a Demir Yorian disinformation campaign deck that I've been playing on stream. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to miss the fake news, man. Yeah, it was like it was one of those C tier cards that we were always hoping would maybe even edge up into the B tier, but it just never quite got there, I think. It's a two for one for three mana that's reusable by playing other good spells in your deck. Too slow. Yep. Not strong enough. Forgot to attack for 15 while also doing that. (laughs) Yep. Even the printing of Yorian couldn't save this card, unfortunately. But that, you know, there were some good, like, one-offs, right? Like, Sinister Sabotage did a lot of work. Like I said, Thoughts Erasure did a lot of work. So good good single surveil cards, but the package as a whole didn't get there. Another one that really didn't get there was the Amass mechanic. Basically saw no standard play. Basically. Like, you didn't see Amass cards working together, I think, at any point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you remember how many people were excited for Dreadhorde Invasion? I know. People thought that it, card was going to break blossom. the format. <laughs> it's bitter blossom, dude. It just is. Uh, talk about a card that just fell flat on its face. Jeez. Yep. But, you know, jank mages everywhere enjoyed enjoyed playing around with it. A couple of other black cards which had some hype, which never really got that dread presence. Powerful card that was just not doing the things that magic is doing these days. Should have been a four or five. Yep. Absolutely. Cowards, you cowards. cowards. Doom Whisperer, card which a lot of people thought. I mean, which is it's just an objectively very good and powerful card, but again, not good enough. Yeah. Fun card though. Like like I've built a stupid amount of decks that went off with Doom Whisperer. The number of times I've surveilled for 18 cards on the same turn is kind of embarrassing. There was something satisfying about having your opponent dead on board if you could just top deck the right thing and then spending 16 life to top deck the right thing. <laughs> oh yeah, it's tutoring the hard way. <laughs> it is. And you know, the times that you didn't get there were as fun as the times you did. So overall, A plus for fun design on that card. We're also just losing a couple of other staples in the form of cards like, yeah, you mentioned Enter the God Eternals. That's been a sideboard staple for a lot of time. Oath of Kaya, that's a card that's going to be missed by a lot of players, especially Yorian players. Mortify, just good kind of all-around removal spell. Is Oath of Kaya the last, like, Gatewatch Oath? It probably is. Are we done with that crap? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the last non-Theros Oh, I guess those are omens. So yeah, it's the last oath. Mm-hmm. All right, good. Uh, and then another another big one rotating out, Casualties of War. So these Ooh. kind of Soltai-ish nonsense decks are losing the card that they all thought was the best card in their deck. That free solution to just anything at all. That, that It's like, it's easy button if you don't want to think, I guess. Exactly. It'll just blow up whatever situation you get yourself into most of the time. Golgari ultimatum. Mm-hmm. I, actually, I like, I like this better than the ultimatums. I'm going to be honest. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah. Cheaper, easier to cast, always has targets, always relevant. I, I think it's, I actually think Casualties of War was a well made card. Uh, I totally weirdly. agree. Balanced, a balanced design card that was good sometimes and not very good other times. Perfect. Let's have more of those, please. Uh, let's talk about a few walkers leaving. Uh, Lilian, a Dreadhorde general. Did you end up feeling like this card got there? It's a tough yes one, and right? No. Yeah. Kind it of. It was no. one of those. The world that Liliana Dreadhorde entered was a place where the rules of magic hadn't been rewritten yet. You know, like what was number one back then? Saltai Midrange. We had Krasis, but we didn't have um, Nissa, right? So it was just all about playing a land and using Jade Light Ranger and Merfolk Branchwalker to explore and get a little value and try to get a little aggressive and having duress at the right time and and thought erasure. You know, they, like this was fair magic. And Liliana was card advantage and board presence and removal in one Planeswalker looked super appealing. And But it, Liliana came out in the wrong set. If if lo- if this card had been two sets prior, it would have been a would staple. Have been strong. I think. Yep. Mm-hmm. But Couldn't Nissa was more. there, and Teferi was there, and the world changed. And going down this list of Black Walkers, that's kind of how I feel about all of them, um, with the possible exception of Kaya Ozov Usurper, which is just an interesting Walker. But I'm looking at Davriel. I'm looking at Vraska Golgari Queen. I'm looking at Bolas. What what was the Grixis Bolas Dragon God? Uh yeah, Nicole Bolas Dragon God. Yeah. Basically it was it was a lot like the Fairy Hero of Dominaria, you know, the plus yes. gets you card advantage, the minus kills a thing, the ultimate wins the game. It was classic. Classic planeswalker. Yeah, these I think all of these were planeswalkers that again would have been strong in like uh if they hadn't also printed Nissa. <laughs> right. If, it's kind of weird to look back at it that way, but it's true. Yeah, like if if they hadn't in the same set printed Nissa and Teferi, then yeah, I think all of these would have been in consideration. Like Vraska Golgari Queen really stands out to me as a planeswalker that just would have been a staple in so many formats. And it saw enough play to be, again, I think like a balanced, interesting, good design, A plus Glad that Planeswalkers have this power level kind of a Planeswalker, but it just could not keep up with the actual busted Planeswalkers. I I agree fully. So anyway, just kind of a shame because I think all of these black Planeswalkers had great designs and it's just kind of unfortunate that they they were released at the time they were. I do think Kaya Ozov Usurper was an interesting Planeswalker that I'm really glad saw some relevant play in Standard for like short bursts super niche right yeah but definitely had its moments eating uro from the graveyard is nice minusing to exile witch's oven is what turned out to be crucial so yeah Yeah. i think a card that ended up being better than a lot of us thought it would be all right let's talk let's go on to another color which is getting absolutely destructipated with <laughs> with the rotation let's talk about red now if you thought that black aggro was getting gutted with rotation oh man red is just getting stomped in the face red is weird because it keeps all the heavy hitters and none of the cards you play before the heavy hitters like annex torbran embercleave seems like you should still be able to lose to these cards but Oddly, what we are learning very quickly in 2021 standard is that what you really lost to was Scorch Spitter, Grim Initiate, Tin Street Dodger, Cavalcade of Calamity, Runaway Steamkin, Light yeah. Up the Stage. You yeah, know, these are these are the cards that wrecked people, which is so weird. Absolutely. And those last two, I think that the the synergy between Steamkin and Light Up the Stage is that was kind of quietly what was making those decks A tier and sometimes S tier. Insane, man. Uh, dude, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've played against somebody who activated Runaway Steam can three or four times in a turn, casting multiple light up the stages. And like the jealousy that my heart feels that freaking Red has a one mana draw to. The first time I read Light Up the Stage, in fact, I think the first 10 times I read Light Up the Stage, I thought they had till the end of the turn to play the cards, the turn they cast it. Yeah. Right? 
right? Because that was the way that formatting always worked. Abbott of Carroll Keep being an example. And it was the first time, I will never forget it as long as I live, the very first day I was in one of those early access events and somebody cast light up the stage and the cards were still there the next turn. I was like, wait, this is just one mana draw to. This is just thought cast, an old blue card. This is, this ain't, this ain't right. Yeah, this is, this is basically hit my land drops in my 18 land deck is what this <laughs> oh, was. God. I mean, uh, this was the card that made shocking your opponent's face a worthwhile thing to do on turn two. I mean, it's just, uh, get out, off, get out with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Gone. Off, off with you. I'm off of its head, man. Never again. <laughs> so I'm sure that, yeah, CGB, as a notable hater of these red aggro strategies, I'm sure you're just just rubbing your hands together with glee watching all of these cards <laughs> leave the format. This is why we need to turn on the webcams, man. This is this yeah. is why we need the video version of the podcast someday. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, we're losing all of this stuff. Just frankly, all of the best things to be doing in red, we are losing. And then just other interesting cards like Dreadhorde Arcanist, which admittedly was never in the same tier as a lot of those other cards we mentioned, but a, a very powerful two-drop red creature, which did make interesting things happen. We're also losing even like some of our hard-hitting threes, like Legion Warboss has just been a total staple in a lot of different archetypes in this format, even like a sideboard juke out of these control decks. Um, saw a lot of play in the sideboards of Fires decks, saw a lot of play in Winota decks, just totally doing work across a lot of different archetypes in the format. There's just a number of really powerful red cards that I wanted to talk about, which never quite got there, or, or cards that got there and then really didn't. So Experimental Frenzy, I think, is a good example of a card which, for a hot minute, was one of the best things to be doing in Standard, and then was just so heavy. I mean, like, has there been a greater fall from Grace than Experimental Frenzy in Standard? It was... It was the moment you knew card advantage would never be the same, right? Because here is a four mana enchantment that to the red mages says, draw your deck, and it wasn't good enough. Like everything, everything had to come with a board presence, you know? And it was really weird seeing cards get spoiled. Um, some examples I'm thinking of are Whirlwind of Thought and Teferi's Ageless Insight. These are four mana, do nothing, but if you untap with them, you get to draw a bunch of cards type of effects and you would see these getting spoiled and you would see players getting excited about these new rare cards and you would say wait a minute they aren't playing experimental frenzy <laughs> like, like how could this possibly be good red decks aren't playing four mana play like 10 spells a turn yeah what could possibly be better than that as a top end in a red deck uh unthinkable Im cleave <laughs> Yeah, it turns out that killing people on turn three or four is better than resolving your frenzy on four. So there you go. Red, it's really interesting, actually, because Red just had a lot of pretty powerful, interesting engine cards that it's losing like frenzy. Another example was Arclight Phoenix, another card which never quite got there in standard. Probably the highest performance with this card was a top eight in the hands of LSV, who could top eight, you know, playing a draft deck in a standard tournament. But Arclight Phoenix, a card which so far has only really made a big splash in modern with a really strong backup, but always a card that I personally was hoping might get there someday. Play three spells, get a 3-2 flyer with haste for free. Not good enough. Uh, Unbelievable. Correction, CGB. Get three 3-2 three, flyers with haste. <laughs> that Now that's good enough, right? <laughs> like if we could do that all the time, we'd be yeah. solid. Yeah, the problem these decks ran into was that you often just spent a lot of time looting, and maybe one game out of five, you'd have the explosive kill them on turn three kind of scenario, but most of the time, you really didn't. So, rip to Arc Like Phoenix, but it was a lot of fun building around you. Um, there were some kind of powerful top end cards that we're losing as well. Niv Mizzet Perun, I believe, won a GP. Perun for a long time was a top end in a lot of controlling and slower decks, and I have definitely both destroyed and been destroyed by this card a lot. It, it's really funny what happened to this card, because it says instant or sorcery, right? Not non-creature. So Teferi, Elspeth Conquers Death, like, 
uh, it's just got it got ugly. It got ugly fast. It did. It really did. Rip Nivmizit Perun, but another I think well balanced, well designed card overall. Expansion Explosion, a card which I'm sure a lot of people will not miss seeing rotate out of the format. To be honest, it's kind of interesting, but even when Reclamation was banned, I thought that this card was going to be dead, but then I forgot that it was actually a pretty relevant part of the Team or Adventure sideboard as well. So overall, a card which ended up being, yeah, it, it, it had its run. Expansion Explosion definitely had its run. And then some other important cards that we're losing in the Gruul archetype. We're losing Gruul Spellbreaker, which is one of the best things to be doing on turn three in that deck. Uh, we're losing Cindervines, important sideboard card in the strategy. Zertar Goblin is leaving the format. Domri's Ambush, one of the better removal spells in the format if you are running the colors. And we're also losing the Domri Anarch of Bolas, which sometimes saw play in these decks. So I think Gruul is taking a fairly big hit. In standard. Darn, darn. Now you have to be an adventure deck, which it probably should have been the whole time. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, I was, like never, these, I was these, never a huge fan. Yeah, these were some of the traps that kept you away from that, right? That kept you away from the adventure version of of uh, Edgewall Innkeeper. Well, there they there they go. Yep, yep. But, you know, if you want to cast Scroll Spellbreaker, you can still do so in Historic, so... Go have fun with that. Now let's talk about the Planeswalkers that we're losing here. I think a lot of these red Planeswalkers, again, they just didn't quite get there. Like, what was the actually super important red Planeswalker in Standard over the last year? There wasn't one. They were all traps. Yeah. Everybody's going to be better with these rotated. Everybody. I, I Let's give a shout out to Acolyte of Flame. It, it was holding together like the... Hmm. Uh, it was giving a good kind of angle of attack to the Cavalcade of Calamity deck. Yeah. Even though that never... That did have a top eight, um, a Mythic Championship top eight from Li Shi Tian. So... Yeah. Yeah, probably the best one overall, but I agree. Before Ugin was the trap to get out of your sideboard with Fair of Wishes, Chandra. Chandra 6 was the trap to get out of your sideboard with Fair of Wishes. <laughs> so yeah, probably people would have won more games just not putting those cards in their decks whatsoever. All right, let's go on to another color, which is just losing some of its hardest hitting cards. Thank God. Oh my gosh. Okay, so basically green is losing 50% of its power in the form of Nissa who shakes the world, and then the other 50% with every other card that's rotating out of green. Let's take a second. Let's tackle Nissa first. Okay. Is that cool? Let's do All it. Because right. we, we've already mentioned her so many times yeah. on this show. I'm, I want to know if you can remember, because I can remember it. What did you think when, what did you think of Nissa who shakes the world when she was previewed? Okay, I remembered thinking, hmm, that's a pretty strong looking card. I don't know how it's going to stack up against the Vivian 5 that was already in standard. A lot of people were suggesting that the existing Vivian 5 was still the stronger card. Oh my god. I vastly underestimated the power of Nyssa. And I remember it was probably the third time I lost to Nyssa on the ladder where I had that moment of, oh, oh god. Guys, guys, okay, this, this, is this card like really good? <laughs> I think, I think it basically took the entire world. It was like, however good you thought Nissa was, it just kept actually being better than that. I remember the first time I saw Nissa, I said that Nissa Krasis looked insane. Yeah. And that aged well. But I wasn't sold on everything else. Like, I, I really, I was like, well, it's five mana, so it can't be totally broken. You could counter it. I hadn't quite processed a world with the Fairy Time Raveler yet. And I also was like, well, it protects itself. It makes a 3-3, three, three, but you have to animate the land. So the land is vulnerable to removal. I hadn't quite processed that removal didn't matter anymore because everything just draws so many cards. Nissa is one of those, it did shake the world in such a way that mana became free and freer, and everything you did created this forward progress on the board. I played a game yesterday, and it really like kind of cemented to me just why this card was stupid. 
I had all the cards in my hand to solve what my opponent was doing. I had Extinction Event, two Elspeth Conquers Death, and my opponent was animating lands with their Nyssa, playing Hydroid Crisis, and also getting back Uro. The problem was I had five lands, they had five lands, but they were doing all these things on the same turn, and I was doing them one turn at a time. And it was just a complete embarrassing fail. And I think the thing that I really got wrong about Nyssa was the impact of haste on those lands. Yes, the haste just, was oh my gosh. crushing. The, the damage starts immediately. And in a format where there are these planeswalkers with passive abilities and you want to be playing them, the ability to just attack down those planeswalkers meant that Nissa often was a 187 creature. You know, Nissa is five mana, make a creature, kill a planeswalker of the opponent's, and if you untap, you have infinite mana, or at least that's how it felt. Like, that's it. That's so much. So I I remember reading this and being like, I'm honestly not sure. This is, this is one of the weirdest cards in the set. It might be the best, or maybe I'm missing something. Uh, it might not. I don't know. It was one of the oddest cards that I read the whole season, and I never felt good about it. Like, I never really knew. I could think about Nyssa all day and I didn't know what it was going to do until I just died to a couple 3-3 lands. And I realized this card is just on its own insane and you can fight everything going on around it and just lose to the land. It's nuts. Yep, that's it. I mean, Nyssa is basically a three-turn clock just by herself. If you've taken any damage in the game, Nyssa can kill you in three turns. And being able to do that while, you know, I mean... Okay, there's so many things that bother me about Nissa, all right? For starters, she lands, she ticks up to six. Ooh, I mean, yes. that six loyalty is brutal. It's brutal. If she'd started at three loyalty, maybe we'd be talking, right? So many cards and creatures have been unplayable because Nissa, like, you just can't deal with that six loyalty. It's impossible. Yeah, like, it's, so much. it's a nightmare for a red deck. It's an absolute nightmare. If you don't, if you don't kill him the next turn with Embercleave, you're just game over. Absolutely game over. I don't know. There were just so many edge cases, too. The lands being elementals. Ooh, that mm-hmm. one bothered me. That one bothered oh, me, right? Yeah. Chandra, Chandra, right? Chandra should have been a game over for that card. I'm so annoyed. Chandra would have been a wonderful foil to Nyssa, but they just, they messed that one up, boy. They messed that one up big time. How about the lands being colorless for Ugin? Yeah, colorless for up? Ugin. You, and then planar cleansing? Nope, that one didn't work yep. either. The number of cards that say non-land permanent on them is actually... Like, you learn really quickly how sad that is. It's brutal. I mean, one of the worst ones, Brazen Borrower. Nope, that's a nope. For that reason alone, she just invalidated so many text boxes. Those lands ended up being brutal. And then, of course, let's not even get started on the Nyssa Ultimate, which is basically, as long as your opponent wasn't a complete moron, the Ultimate was always a game over. So... Nissa just, I, I'm just gonna, she's the gangster of the format. She was just like secretly behind the scenes, just like bullying, bossing, and dominating the turf of everything. The moment Oko was banned, Nissa just became basically the best thing to do. Can I tell you my favorite Nissa moment as she's on her way out the door? Just, just send her off nice. Were we hanging out when I did the 250 card Simic deck? So we we weren't, but I remembered watching that deck just briefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you have if if you do one thing, if you do one thing with the next like two or three weeks, play the two hundred and fifty card Simic deck, Ultimate Nissa for like a hundred forests for a billion forests. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Crisis it's, the next turn. It's a race against the rope, just trying to get all of them. <laughs> I know, you know, that was one of those things where when did anyone ever not pick them all? I mean, why would it? Why would you? you couldn't we just why, have an all button? You? It bothered me. Anyway, so Nissa, basically nobody, with the possible exception of Andrea Mangucci, is going to miss Nissa <laughs> rotating out of standard. Nisa. It's going to miss Nisa. And taking with her her favorite jellyfish pet, <laughs> the, the jellyfish Hydra. You know, they were basically born together and they're basically dying together and good riddance to both of them is all I have to say. Not necessarily. Hydroid Crisis 
is the older brother here. It is. It is. Yep. Hydrate Crisis was pretty cool because it snuck up on people how good it was because it was introduced before the world changed, before mana was free and infinite. So, like, casting Crisis for four and casting Crisis for six out of your Sultai deck that played one land a turn was just a thing you did for a while, and it was really good, but it wasn't broken. You know what I mean? It was actually a really cool card until mana went nuts. Absolutely. I had a lot of fun just trying Crisis in various shells. I, you know, I played these janky decks that were running Vivian, Champion of the Wilds, with... Uh, wilderness reclamation and doing end of turn massive crises i was I, you know i played some of those weird like team of fires lists that would hard cast the the crisis with the available mana there was a lot of fun stuff to do with crisis so i agree that bef- yeah before like you said mana went nuts it was it was a good card it was one of the stronger cards in the format but it wasn't such a perverse game warping disgusting card it was as close as I think we're going to get to Sphinx's revelation that comes with a body. So I, I'm going to miss Crisis a little. It was always kind of this fun snow, like end game that snowballed well. But I will admit, I liked it a lot better before casting it for 10 was almost trivial. Like something that happened all the time. Here's one of the things that I think people don't give enough credit to with crisis is that it gives you a lot of it gives you and your opponents a lot of really interesting game options so the question of when to cast it what point on the curve to cast it how much to cast it for did you want to leave mana open to be able to cast the following cards did you counter your opponent's crisis yes or no did you bounce your opponent's crisis yes or no i think these are all really interesting questions when the mana is not busted so i think overall it was a really it was a great design and it basically got recruited into the gang right it, it, it was yeah it, it kind of it got nabbed off of the street and forced to do atrocious things <laughs> sure <laughs> All right, let's discuss some other cards. So a card which I think wouldn't be remotely playable were it not for Nyssa, Arboreal Grazer. Talk about like the jankiest card that got the biggest promotion in the history of Magic. (laughs) Man, pros are on record and and they're right in saying so, but this was called the Green Mulligan. Yeah. it (laughs) It was considered that bad. And that's because we did not have experience, especially in a format like Standard, playing yeah. 29 lands in our deck to make sure Grazer happened. Yeah. And when we realized that being the first one to get to an Oko or a Nissa or whatever the big end game was, was really all that mattered now, because there were going to be endless cards and endless mana once we did, people got on board because that's now we're running in, like so many lands. And Grazer also, I think people started to respect Grazer and figure this out with Field of the Dead. I think Field of the Dead shed some light on it. And then later on, like the decks that we've seen with Uro and Nyssa, the the Saltai decks and such, they kind of hung on to what they knew about Grazer, that he's actually a really hardworking sloth, despite being awkward and disappointing a good amount of the time. Dude, I mean, the Sloth just delivered in a surprising number of archetypes. It ended up being one of the crucial cards in these green base mutate decks, surprisingly. I think it really did. It put in its work throughout the standard format. And I I got to give props to Wizards for it, for being a balanced design. When you put Arboreal Grazer next to Explore, tell me which of those cards is a balanced design. Okay, you had perverse enough incentives that you could just run Arboreal Grazer in your deck because it didn't matter because you're eventually going to draw a billion cards. But I think this is the kind of, this is what Ramp needs to look like. Ramp needs to look more like Arboreal Grazer than like Growth Spiral in order for it to be a balanced strategy in Magic. Yeah, it buys time and has a serious downside and an a terrible fail state. Like if you are ever, if you ever see your green opponent on turn two, just long pause manual tap the forest play the grazer no fall no up. land <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know in those long grindy like sultai mirrors right when you're both top decking and you see yeah you see the long pause and then the grazer hit the battlefield oh best feeling in magic <laughs> 
<laughs> CGV is doing the slow clap, indeed. Rest in so, peace, Grazer. Yeah, excellent. And that reach as well. That reach. You know, one of the most satisfying things I have ever done in Magic is go turn one Grazer against my mono blue tempo opponent. And that was just the, <laughs> that was the saddest, curious obsession that was ever cast in the history of Magic, man. <laughs> Long pause. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so rip our burial grazer all right let's talk a little bit more about the mana that we're losing we're, we're losing so much mana all right so we're losing as far as i can tell three two mana docks that have all seen play in standard at various times in the form of incubation druid leafkin druid and paradise druid so and for me paradise druid really ended up being the mvp a card that has put in a tremendous amount of work in a lot of different archetypes and I I think this is just one of the best design magic cards I've ever seen, period. I hate this card. <laughs> like, I hate it so much. But the two-mana hexproof card, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. And, oh, yeah. It's, I just hate it. I, I hate it with mutate. I hate it with auras. I hate it in just ramp. Like, the, the downside, like, you, mm, there should be something to interact with this crap, man. Oh, we... We, we discovered one of CGB's <laughs> pet peeve cards. <laughs> it is. It's one of my pet peeve cards. It is. Well, especially as a control mage, I'm sure this card is just not doing you any favors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it does kind of break the rule of the mana dork, right? Which is that mana dorks need to have a downside, and Paradise Druid largely didn't have a downside. It existed in a time with Goblin Chain Whirler. That's true. And things were okay. That's true. But then Goblin Chain Whirler rotated. And I had to just stare at this weird little green, funky, not an, even an elf. Like, what the heck is, is it an elf? She, she looked so innocent, she CGB. Ugh. She looked so innocent. Here's the thing. I, I would be fine with it until people just started like, I'm going to mutate onto her, but never a jack. <laughs> yes. Boggles. Big brain. Oh, Wow. <laughs> the world's weirdest boggles deck. But yeah, surprisingly effective sometimes. All right, let's talk about another massive archetype, which is taking a huge hit in the form of mono green aggro. So mono green aggro is losing arguably a lot of its incentives here, losing its only playable one drop in the form of Pelt Collector, also losing one of its better two drops in the form of Barkide Troll, losing one of its worst traps in the form of Growth Chamber Guardian, and another card which I ended up thinking was mostly a trap, but did have a few applications in, in Crawl Harpuna. But I know both of those last two that I listed were cards which Rint and other people had been fairly high on during its life cycle. We are also losing the Queen of Mono Green in the form of Vivian Arcbo Ranger. So I think we're losing... I would say maybe 60% of our incentives to play this archetype. We do still keep a number of very, very strong cards. But it's, again, just like Mono Red, it's just kind of had its soul ripped out. I don't know. I, I think the Pelt Collector is the one there that hurts. I think we're fine without the rest. It's been kind of... I, I'm, no, I'm no green, deep-diving <laughs> mega mage like you. And Arcbo Ranger is nice, but... I I've been I've been having some fun with mono green. I just I'm leaning into the things that take it the furthest into more of a like a combo deck and try to bring back the realms of broken mana. I'm just I'm trying to play a great henge and make it huge, man. I'm trying to I'm trying to have really epic great henge moments. I've got four great henge in my current mono green for 2021. Four. Wow. Get a load of the. This is you know why you like that card, CGB. It's as close as Mono Green comes to playing Control. <laughs> That's why you like that card. Stop! Stop! No! No! <laughs> I'm, who would like drawing cards? No, Green is great for drawing cards. You get Edgewall Innkeeper. You get the yeah. Great Henge. You just you oh know, my gosh, endless card advantage. I will say of of all of that cycle from Eldraine, I think the Henge ended up being the one that was the most balanced and the most interesting. So I have to give the Henge good. It's just a, another really excellently designed card. And I do think it's a card that, that Mono Green needed. So A plus for that one. Love it. Yeah, your creature deck plays longer games. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's interesting. Your red deck playing shorter games, 
Not so interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's not adding to the story. Okay, uh, let's just talk about a number of other cards that we're losing. We're losing a big top end threat in the form of Enray's Forerunners. So our Transmogrify and Luca decks just got a lot worse. Our Mutate decks just got a lot worse. So any kind of go over the top green deck is going to miss that one. Uh, another thing we're losing is the Elemental package. So, you know, if you're someone who's enjoyed doing the Risen Reef thing, the Omnath Dude. thing. Got so old. Yeah. Oh, I am not sorry to see these leave. Yeah. Take one more spin with them. If the if this was your jam, I I, I remember how exciting Risen Reef into Risen Reef was yeah. for a long time until it wasn't exciting anymore. Yeah. I know. It's just this this falls in the category of janky decks that I didn't think were very good, but which I always hated losing to. So just not not a fan on either side of the battlefield, really. I should do a stream. I should do one more stream with um, Risen Reef Mirror March. Oh, Just baby! One more. Keep oh, some stats. Oh, baby! Yep. How many how many flips can we get? Yep. How how quickly can you deck yourself? <laughs> yeah, no win con. Just we're gonna <laughs> deck ourselves. That's all. <laughs> love it, love it. The loss is the true win. All right, I think that's enough for green. I just wanted to cover a few of the kind of colorless cards that are leaving the format. Uh, none of these are like massive, massive haymakers. We are losing Golos, so one of my favorite cards rotating out of the format. We're also losing Blast Zone, which has been fairly relevant in various archetypes. So I think that's a card, or another really well-balanced, really well-designed card, which allowed you to get around a lot of restrictions, allowed you to do things like kill your opponents to fairy at instant speed, gave you a lot of game against decks that were trying to flood the board with one-cost creatures. Just an all-around fantastic card that I think a lot of decks are going to end up missing. Yeah, full agree, full endorse. Yeah, gates are going, so if you are a gate jank mage, that will no longer be playable in standard. We're also losing mobilized districts. This was a card which wasn't really played until recently in... I don't think we'll miss this. I think creature lands are very likely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we'll probably get better replacements, so that's a really good point. Uh, a card which I do think is a shame to not have in the format anymore is Graph Digger's Cage. So, dude, just note dude. that, man. If if Winota goes on an ascension in Zendikar or later, we're going to be really sorry that we don't have Graph Digger's Cage. Yeah, and and Ur, you know Uro and Croxa, yeah, are are both big parts of the format. Yeah, I I would prefer to keep the cage. I just feel safer, warmer with a cage nearby. Because I'll tell you what, Tormod's Crypt is a nice, like, short-term answer, but it is not, it is not Graph Digger's Cage. Mm -hmm. And then we're losing Khan the Great Creator. He was always interesting, interesting guy to play around with. Uh, sometimes decent, mostly jank. Content creator's dream. Yeah. You could build a Karn deck in all kinds of different colors, and it would always be a different Karn deck, but you would keep the sideboard almost the same. Yep, yep, <laughs> exactly. We're also losing the only thing most people got from the board with it, which is Meteor Golem. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, come on. There were many interesting Carnival options. <laughs> the Carnival. I, ne I, I don't think I ever got a Meteor Golem. Really? But I will tell you, it was always there. <laughs> okay, yeah. I I remember there were points. I was playing the, the Nyssa quote-unquote Tron deck in Standard, and there was one point where I actually had four Meteor Golems in the sideboard, and there were occasional games where I wished for all four of them. That sounds like a personal problem. Let me tell you, <laughs> Golem Tribal was a fun time, man. That was a fun time. Another fun time, which never quite got, got there, was Mystic Forge. Another content creator's dream card right there. Mm, that card sucked. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't actually good. Another card that sucked, which I got a lot of reps in with, was Chromatic Lantern. So this is my kind of card. Don't put it in your deck, chat. Chat, don't put it in your deck, but I loved it. All right, any closing thoughts before we just bid a swift adieu to this incarnation of Standard? Closing thoughts on this incarnation of Standard? Dude, they, they tried... I feel like every generation 
you need to do this. Every every generation of game designers needs to like spread its wings and figure out who they are as game designers every generation. And the old people will sit back in their chairs and be like, hey, we, why haven't they learned anything? How could they know? Didn't we already learn this stuff? Nope, we had to learn it for ourselves. They They pretty much broke all the rules and it blew up in their face. And uh, another generation has learned that mana should not be free. Card draw should not be infinite. Planeswalkers should not be three mana with a million relevant abilities and a ton of loyalty. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can put that behind us. CGB, here's what I learned. Here's what I learned from my last year of playing Standard. I really, really, really want to live in a world where I don't have to feel like I have to play green. Wow. I just, yeah. like, people think of me as a green mage. You know why? It's just the right color to be playing, man. Like, if you're not playing green, what are you doing? What are you doing with yourself? I mean, and people have banged on about this, but it's really true. Green just got everything. It really did. It got everything you could ever want. And it was just disgusting. It was just disgusting, frankly. So I'm really ready to live in a world where green isn't just the de facto best thing to be doing at all times. I agree. I hope that Zendikar is basically a four-color set, and what green gets is a bunch of three-mana three-threes, baby. (laughs) Throw some vigilance on those suckers. (laughs) Oh, baby. Yeah, I... This is what I want. I want green to return to giving us like four mana planeswalkers that fetch a forest off the top of the deck. That's what I that's what I want green to to go back to. Gotcha. That's what Nissa was born to be, right? That's that's mm. what Nissa in her heart is. So go go back, baby. You've you've drunk too much. Nissa, you're drunk. Go home. I think that the biggest crime of all of this is that I don't think anybody ever hated a Nissa planeswalker before. No. Absolutely not. Like that was to fairy and Jace's territory, yep. you know, the annoying planeswalkers. Yeah, it was always the blue planeswalkers. Na- yep. Now every Nissa is going to get the groan treatment for a while. Man. Yeah, man. What did her, Nissa ever do? Her, her Yelp ratings are at an all time low. You you can't <laughs> so. shake the world without making some enemies, my friend. Indeed. You know, when you're on top, your ass is showing. That's all I can say. All right. <laughs> That's going to wrap up this episode of the Arena Craft Podcast. Thanks again for joining us. CGB is just laughing in his chair. Thanks again for joining us for another edition, for sitting through the long expositions. I hope it was worth it. You can find Arena Craft in all the places you can find podcasts. Please subscribe on your favorite platform. Leave us a review on iTunes. Things are also blowing up. CGB, we actually, on some of these episodes, we're actually getting more views and listens on YouTube than we are on our native platform, which, so I just want to shout out our YouTube audience. You guys are wonderful. Please keep showing up. Please keep leaving comments. We've been hitting all kinds of milestones and everything is good. So we love you, YouTube. Thumbs up. Uh, you can catch CGB on his YouTube channel, Covert Go Blue. You can also find him on his stream Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, doing a wonderful combination of talking about magic and playing magic. So go ahead and check him out. CGB, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to get into Zendikar next week. Yeah, baby. My favorite cards are always the next ones. <laughs> the next ones. Indeed. May they be fresh. May they be balanced. May we enjoy them. All right, buddy. Catch you next week. Later. Later.